Hi, I'm John Murray, and this is Tower Recommends. A bald fertilizer and brake fluid. Who in the hell am I supposed to trust? Sympathy ends in gas chambers. Oklahoma City. First off, we're going to talk about the real blur, the American version. I think Damon Albarn said that he just wanted to be this band for good reason, because this band is an incredible band. Most people would say this is their worst record, though all those people would be wrong. It's not their worst record at all. Um, AT&T is one of the greatest songs of all time. Lately, My Heart is Made of Gravy, one of the best lyrics ever written. Save me. did a reunion tour. They played in Berkeley, California, and I lied and said I knew how to play pedal steel. And Spiral Stairs, Scott's manager, was a, a friend, so he, he bought it. And uh, so Parker got me out there, and I played pedal steel on Father to a Sister of a Thought. And I remember the moment when Stephen Mountain was looked over, and I had not met him. After the show, I told him that he was my hero accidentally. It's the only embarrassing moment in sort of like, you know, like, I've met, like, people that I guess are supposed to be famous to err, you know? But nobody was as cool as Stephen Malmus. He was like, for real? And I was like, yes. Uh, sorry that I said that. And he was like, that's okay. And then for about an hour, we talked about baseball. And the dude is just real. And his hair was perfect. There was no sweat on it. After a two-hour grueling show of flipping his guitar around and whatnot. But this record is one of the most interesting sounding records. Uh, probably because Stephen says that he was... He had, a, he had quite a marijuana problem at the time. So it sounds like a kind of a, it's like Pavement's, uh, it is like Pavement's Velvet Underground record in that way. I think that the Elephant Six Collective was one of the most incredible kind of things during this era, era kind of in Athens, Georgia. Jeff Mangum was just one of the most interesting people I'd ever met. I remember when uh, Brandon Robertson and Brad Possilway brought me back. They lived in the same house with him and he annoyed them all the time. So he would come over after they moved to Memphis back down there. And they're the first guys that I recorded with at Easley, where that was recorded. Was! This is getting weird because I didn't mean to do that. That was funny. But he did this on a four track or an eight track. It was about a decade later that Merge picked up the record and. They, he, he started doing, I think, I, think I, mean, I remember, I think he did like the Hollywood Bowl and stuff like He did weird, huge shows and gave away all of the money. He's a really nice guy, but um, like we were saying earlier, yes, very pure. He liked to bite my dog and my dog liked to bite him back. Just a nice, nice, well, I don't know if I'll say he's nice. He's beyond nice. He had transcended the necessity of niceties. I can hear as you tap on your jar And I am listening to hear where you are I am listening to hear where you are uh, uh, He just didn't have the ego that other people did, you know? I mean, it's like, I, I, I remember seeing him and Bill Callahan the same week one time and they played for about the same number of people, you know, and it was Bill, Bill Callahan and Smog, and, you know, maybe it was Memphis, you know, but I don't, I don't think so. I think it was sort of just American culture at the time, and it's kind of beautiful to see 10 years later all these people, like, the same year Slint, that record. It's like a really beautiful thing to see these huge shows happen for these people who never, never got their due but affected so many other people. With Jeff, it was a little sad, I think, because um, I think... Well, he, he didn't. He didn't really do anything after um, after he did the Neutral Milk Hotel stuff the first time around. So I don't know. I think it was. I don't know if he was disappointed or if he just thought, well, do you know, there's not many people coming to these shows and it's a long drive. Do you know? But I miss those shows. Mike Timmons, like when I was in France at the beginning of the lockdown, he just goes, "Dude, have you heard the new Fiona Apple record?" And I was like, um, <clears throat> "No." 
and um, <clears throat> and so I listened to it, and we talked for about a month about why do we like this record so much. Now I realize, like, I think the polyrhythms are freaking incredible. She she played on, she's she's playing on Dylan's last record. Like, do you know this woman's a genius? Like, um, like for real. I think I want you to love me, and um, I think uh, oh, what's the one about um, what is it? Relay? Yeah. There's just lyrically, there's incredible stuff going on here too, but sonically, it's just one of the most interesting sounding things I've heard in a long, long time. I don't know, I think if sexism weren't such a thing, you know, like she would get her doing the same way that like, I don't know, like Bob Dylan does, but whatever, you know, maybe one day, or Joni Mitchell, you know, like, but it took Joni a while too, I guess. So. This is maybe this is maybe the best, my favorite live record of all time. I have seen Irish folks in the Republic stand up in living rooms with virtually no one in them except for me, and say, when Van Morrison gets on stage, you know, when you can hear him <clears throat> or watch it, this is why I'm proud to be Irish, you know, and uh, I love that, especially given he's from up the north, you know. I grew up across the river from Levon Helm, and he would play in Memphis on Mondays when his, he had one lung that collapsed and he would just play at this, at, at a venue called Kings on Bill Street and oh, his band was called the Barn Burner, so he couldn't sing, but he's just the sexiest drummer I've ever, like I've never seen someone that could sort of swing that way. I don't know, I think the coolest rock and roll story I have is that I had a guitar player at the time when we were just kids, you know, um, named Joe Shiki, and uh, sorry Joe, because Joe's a professor now. So maybe this will get him fired. But Levon Helm was like, uh, asked us if we knew where some weed was and whatnot. Of course, I don't know where drugs are. And, um, but Joe did. And um, so Joe, I mean, that, that's what college professors do. And so, we well, wasn't a professor at the time. So Joe um, went and got Levon Helm some weed. And he comes back and he goes, don't you think it's a little young, Joe? And I mean, I, I just love it that I could go, oh man, you, you, you sold Levon Helm bad weed. You know? The musicianship of a guy like Garth Hudson, you know, or the just the way that the band was kind of put together out of the hulks and kind of became this machine that, not even a machine, but just this creative force that Dylan could kind of slot into in Woodstock and then they could kind of move on and do, they, I mean, they moved so so much between genres that they were the last, in my mind, like Tin Pan Alley songwriting crew, you know? I picked this up because this is just honesty. When when I first heard this record, I really haven't quit listening to it since. It was either going to be this or um, Black Messiah, the D'Angelo record. But like, that when anyone want to question like why he won the Pulitzer Prize, we can fight outside. Do you know what I mean? Like this guy can write, you know. Um, and I think that um, I think Kendrick Lamar's journey, like as a as an artist, is one of the most truly artistic things that I've ever seen. Do you know the way that he's grown as a human being and I think we may look back in time and see him as being someone comparable to a Joe Strummer or uh, a Bob Marley in the way that we see him as almost a spiritual figure, you know? I think when you really pay attention to the jazz elements and to the, not, not, not so much on, on this record as on to Pimple Butterfly, but I think that this record, it seems like the culmination of a whole lot of both angst and love, you know? And it's just one of the most accessible, it's one of the best pop records that I've ever heard. It's the best hip hop record that I mean in my mind since Stankonia. Since I feel like a chip on my shoulders. I feel like I'm losing my focus. I feel like I'm losing my patience. I feel like my thoughts in the basement feel like I feel like you're miseducated. Feel like I don't wanna be bothered. I feel like you may be the problem. I feel like it ain't no tomorrow. Fuck the world. The world you listen to you know how much sound is moving, like moving around. They mix all the way through in mono. Like, yeah, because he's, he's, he's working on everything all the way through. 
if you go, there's a great conversation with him and Rick Rubin just about creativity. And I mean, it gets into this territory where it's it's like getting to watch a sort of, I don't know, like a lecture with Van Gogh or something, you know? Rick Rubin's like really soaking it up. I think, I think he, um, he's just not afraid, you know? He's fearless in that way. And I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know? Um, he's also just, I think, a lovely human being. I think he's more than gifted. I think he just, he really gives a damn about what he does, you know? Maybe that's what's called it. I don't know. But I think <clears throat> that's a rarity nowadays. Okay, this, controversial. See, like, this is Layla and other sort of love songs. Eric Clapton was strung out on heroin at the time. If it hadn't been for that, it would, I don't think Eric Clapton could have made a good record. But you've got Tom Dowd engineering, and you've got, he had done the cream stuff, and so you've got Dwayne Allman, you know, just kind of jammed for days. When Clapton showed up, Tom Dowd said, like, where's your guitar, where's your amplifier? He just had a little gold spoon around his neck for the heroin, but not for, he had nothing when it came to guitar or amp or anything like that, even though he was there to make a record. So they went to a shop and they bought that guitar that became really iconic and worth a load of money that was apparently kind of crappy. Like, if you listen to Clapton on um, that, it, it's, uh, this is vicious. Uh, songs like, well, like Layla is like this Albert King riff that Dwayne Allman sped up. It's, it's got this incredible sort of like, this, this will sound terrible, but like bar band kind of version of Little Wing that really works, or uh, I Am Yours, or Any Day. Bobby Whitlock, I think, is another big part of it. He was a, uh, uh, he was a writer for Stax, and Bobby Whitlock came after me because I covered the last song on this record for the Bass of Sage, so Thorn Tree in the Garden, um, which is actually about a dog. It's not about a lady. Well, he wrote that song after what Leon Russell said to him, if you don't get rid of that dog, um, I'm going to get rid of it. And he loved that dog, and he woke up one day and the dog was gone. And so he wrote the song, and uh, he said, you're going to regret this one day. And I hope, I hope Leon did, because it's a really lovely song. There's a thorn tree in the garden, if you know just what I mean. And I hate to hurt your feelings, but it's not the way it seems. Because I miss her. It's one of the messiest, when you really get into it, it's like one of the messiest records that you could, I mean, the, the, the drummer from the band killed his mother with a hammer um, a year after it came out, and he's still in a, an asylum. My, this woman I know in London, Kathleen, she's married to a neurosurgeon now, but she used to date him, Jim Gordon, like, right before that happened. She also took the phone call from Graceland to Priscilla that said, uh, Elvis is dead, like she was the switchboard person who got to stay alone for three seconds. But um, Carl Riddell played bass and he was in, um, uh, what, Delaney and Bonnie, and, uh, and uh, Jim Gordon was in Delaney and Bonnie, the drummer. I think that might be my favorite record of all time. I know that sounds fucked up. I've never listened to it. You have to listen to this. There is a book that a woman from the University of Texas in Austin wrote about the book. It makes it so interesting and accessible. Tim Mooney, uh, who produced like the Grace of the American Music Club drummer and just incredible producer, musician, and engineer stuff. He, Tim sort of forced the record on me and I, I kept thinking, why the hell is he trying to make me listen to Eric Clapton, that racist? He gave me this book and then I kind of got into the record more so after that and then as an entire piece and I guess felt a bit justified when Jason Isbell said the same, we were having a conversation about it. I was like, oh, okay, he, he thinks that this is one of the best records of all time, too. I've been John Murray. I might be John Murray. I hope I'm John Murray. And this has been Tower Records. I refuse to leave you alone, me.